to my channel learning with Lou. Today I'm going to be talking about my miscarriage and the story in which involves in that. So what happened before I was pregnant, what happened during I was pregnant, and what happened after and how I'm dealing slash dealt a little bit with it. This may bring up some emotions to those that have had a miscarriage before or know someone that has. It is not my intention to, to bring up those feelings or to be a trigger. I want to share this story mainly for women out there that have had a miscarriage or just found out that they did and that it's okay. And I also want to share it to my daughter. So hopefully when she gets older, she knows how important she is to me and that her being alive is the greatest blessing that I've had. Other than my husband, my husband's awesome. So, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get emotional so quickly. So let me, let me share this. So before I even found out that I was pregnant, my husband and I just got engaged. He had to fly back here to the States because he lived here, he was a citizen here. And I was a citizen of Australia, so during that four months before we got married, I had I visited a doctor, and that doctor told me that I might have trouble getting pregnant, and that was the first shock to my system because I was like, women are born to be able to have children, like that's what the ovaries and the uterus are for. And uh, so I discussed this with my fiance at the time and one of the reasons why I love this man is because he was just, okay, if we can't have children, we'll adopt. <laughs> just like that, he, he was so accepting. And so um, we kind of already prepared for the worst in regards to not getting pregnant. Anyways, we got married four months later. He moved back to the States. We weren't trying. We weren't, we were preventing everything because he had to fly back to the States about four months later and I wouldn't be able to join him for at least another six months because I was waiting for my visa. Actually, more permanent resident visa, but visa nonetheless. So, <clears throat> About six months later, I was able to fly here to the States as a visitor. And yes, I followed all the rules in regards to be, like the applying for a permanent residency to, all the way through to like just visiting for some time. I had a return ticket. Like I wasn't going to mess with the system. I was following all the rules. I am a rule follower. Okay. So I was under a visitor visa at the time and my husband and I decided to start trying. And so we tried for a couple of months because I was only here in the States for about two and a half, three months as a visitor, again, following all the rules and still nothing, not falling pregnant. I don't even think I had, a, I didn't even have a period during that time because I'm, I'm a very irregular period individual. So... I got an email stating that my permanent residency interview was scheduled uh, for about two months ahead. So I flew back to Australia about four weeks before my visa interview because I had to finish up a couple of uh, university things and uh, work things and other stuff. So. I finished all that. I was like, hmm, I'm going to take a pregnancy test. I kind of feel a bit weird. Took one, said I wasn't pregnant. 
And then about two weeks, no, not even two weeks, about a week later, I was craving salt and sweet foods at the exact same time. So my brother was living with my parents at the time where, where I was staying. And I, I was craving fried corned beef and Milo with ice cream. Milo is an Australian chocolate deliciousness. If you've had it, it's great. I love it. So I would have, you know, my ice cream with Milo on top of it and I'd mix it in. And I had my fried corned beef with extra salt. And I was eating the two simultaneously. And my brother looked over and was like, you're pregnant. I'm like, no, I'm not. I just took a test. It said I was negative. I thought about it for about a day or two because I kept having these cravings. And so I decided to take another test. And it was positive. I hopped out of that bathroom with a big smile on my face. <laughs> my <laughs> Unfortunately, my brother was the first one to find out because he was like, you're pregnant, aren't you? Because he saw the beaming smile over my face. I had later asked him how he knew that I was pregnant. And he was like, no one comes out of the bathroom <laughs> that happy. <laughs> Which is kind of funny when you think about it. So I called my husband and I told him I was pregnant. Again, he was living here in the States. I was here. I was in Australia, sorry. And I called a doctor. I scheduled an appointment. I got the blood work done. I was about five weeks. So five weeks pregnant. So it means my first ultrasound was until another three weeks, which hopefully by then I was going to be in the States. But then I had to go to my visa interview. So if anyone's been through that process, it is. It's, it's scary. So I got all dressed up. Um, I was about four hours away from the interview place. So my brother drove me and I was so sick already. I was had an extreme morning sickness. In fact, my brother had to pull over a couple times for me to chuck it over. Um, <laughs> oh, looking back, my poor brother. Um, unfortunately, there was one time he couldn't pull over fast enough, so I kind of threw up in his car. I, I still feel really bad about it. He laughs over it. But yeah, so anyway, we got we got to the got to the interview place on time, and went up the stairs and waited in line for my interview and really it's not really an interview it's more of a case of question and answer well that was my case it was question and answer and then they said sorry we can't give you your visa your permanent residency visa today and I was like why well they wanted two documents both written and signed by my father-in-law and my husband just two handwritten documents was what they were wanting and I'm like that's ridiculous they had all anyways I'm not going to complain about that because they let me in the country eventually and so they told me to get those documents in and then they'll schedule another one it wasn't for another two three weeks yeah, two, three weeks by that point that I got my second interview. They said, yep, congratulations, you're good. Now you just need an x-ray, you need some blood work, you need other stuff before you can even enter the country. So I went back to Sydney again. By this point, guys, I am extremely sick. So my poor brother, he drove me up there. I'm pretty sure he did. I think he did. This time I was a little bit more prepared. I went in there and I did the health things and one of the one of the health things that you have to do is take an x-ray for tuber just in case you have tuberculosis because they don't want that in the country. And 
they asked me if I was pregnant. I said yes. And they're like, okay, we'll try to put this metal plate across your stomach so that we can reduce the the radiation going to the towards the, the fetus. They gave me the option to not do it and to postpone it until after I had given birth. But they wouldn't have let me to go to come here to the States before that health check was done. So in that one minute quick discussion, I had to make a decision without talking to my husband, without thinking it through, without doing any research, which is not me. It was wait in Australia for nine, 10, 12 months for me to give birth to this child or take an x-ray and risk it. But yet yeah, be with my husband. I took the x-ray. Okay guys, I had 30 seconds to make this decision. And when I found out that the baby had passed, I blame myself so much. Because I thought it was the x-ray that did it. Because I thought I was being selfish. Anyways, after that, I went back home. Again, it's like four hour trip one way, four hour trip the other. And I was about, um, about a week later, I was about eight weeks pregnant and I was able to do an ultrasound. So my brother, he drove me to the town nearby, which is about 45 minutes. Just so you know, I lived in the country of Australia, so only certain places had certain things. So he drove me there and he was able to see the eight week old baby. Apparently the heartbeat was okay. Everything looked good inside. It was, it was quite a moment to share with my brother. I was sad that I couldn't share it with my husband because that was the last time that I was ever going to see that baby alive. And by alive, I mean like heart beating, like everything was okay. So, but I got a CD so I could share with him. I got some pictures and then like two or three days after that ultrasound, I got my visa. So within a day or two, I booked my ticket, my brother drove me back to Sydney and I was able to fly out to LA. Now, if anyone has been eight weeks pregnant, had extreme nausea and tried to fly 15 odd out or 12 hours and then another four, it's so hard. I was sick the whole time. There was no sleeping on the plane for me. I told, I made sure that I sat in an aisle seat. I told the person that was sitting next to me, I said, Hey, I'm sorry. I have extreme morning sickness and I'm probably going to be throwing up all the time. And, and I'm sorry. I told all the flight attendants <laughs> about my condition. Cause I said there might be a non, like a, clip in your seatbelt sign and I'm going to have to dash to the bathroom and which is what I had to do. Take off. I threw up before we were about to land. I was holding it in, holding it in, trying not to throw up. And then as soon as we touched and were like on the ground, but yet the seatbelt sign was still like, keep your seatbelt in. I, I had to go to the bathroom and I just, I started throwing up. Well, bad. 
but they let me in the country even through that extreme nauseated experience of flying and I was able to be with my husband now because of insurance here in the States I don't know what happened my husband was it was it was odd we we're trying to figure it all out um, I had to basically do my best until that insurance kicked in at the beginning of the, of the new year, which was about a month ish away at this, at this stage. Again, guys, my extreme nausea was so bad that I was throwing up more than three times a day, which if you throw up more than three times a day, something's wrong. I tried everything. The smell of food would set me off. This is actually where I developed my philosophy of same thing goes down, comes back up. So that's where I developed that because of this extreme nausea. It got so bad that I had to go visit the hospital in our local town that we we're staying in. My husband was so worried about me and he was he was correct to be worried. I was extremely dehydrated to the point where they couldn't hardly find a vein in my arm, which normally isn't a problem. They had to pump, I think it was like two and a half bags of fluids. It was something crazy. And by that stage, I was worried about my baby. I was about 11 weeks by this stage according to that blood test and everything and they did an ultrasound and now the ultrasound machine was extremely old it was the worst it didn't have any sound or anything like that and the doctor was like well your baby looks about 10 weeks which you know 10 11 weeks yeah um but we can't see anything it nothing seems to be the problem By that stage, my, my little baby had already passed and I didn't know. Through this whole time, I was talking to my mother regularly, sharing my symptoms. Um, not only did I have extreme nausea, but I did have a little bit of bleeding, which made me freak out and I should have, that should have been the first warning. But all the research that I did and when I talked to my mom, I was like, okay, bleeding a little bit is okay. It's not like a full period. It was just like a little bit of spotting. I should be okay. I just read my diary back then and before I visited the hospital, I think the day, the day of or the day before, I was vomiting up blood. I was so delusional, guys, because all I wanted was this baby to be born. I prayed so hard that everything was going to be okay. It was actually very interesting. Every time I, my husband prayed, he, he couldn't say, please let the baby be okay. It was all my health that he was praying about. I think you already knew that something was wrong. Anyways, because of how sick I was, my husband and I decided to move back in with his parents and get some help from, from them because I was still quite bedridden and we're still waiting on insurance, but we were able to visit a hospital and do a little hospital tour to see, you know, cause by this point in time, I'm about 16 weeks pregnant and I was so excited. And our insurance came in and I scheduled an appointment with our midwife for the first time. And I was so excited. Cause I wanted my husband to, to hear the heartbeat, to see the baby. 
And uh, so he came with me, which I'm so glad he did. And then at our midwife appointment, she, she looked at me and she's like, okay, how far along you are? And I was like, I'm about 17 weeks, 18 weeks-ish. And she's like, okay, you definitely look it, because I was starting to show then. And and then she got the, the Doppler machine, which uh, is basically like an ultrasound just for hearing the heartbeat. There's no screen. And she's trying to find the, the heartbeat. Couldn't hear anything, couldn't hear anything. And my heart is just dropping. Because I knew something was wrong. She's like, hold on a second, I'm going to get someone else that's better than me in fighting heartbeats. And I looked over at my husband and I'm like, something's wrong. The, the doctor came in and tried to have a look and was like, you know what, let's just do an ultrasound. So we waited in the lobby for a little bit and then they had the ultrasound available and they pulled out the ultrasound and here am I looking, praying, everything was okay. But it wasn't. The doctor turned off the ultrasound and said, I'm so sorry. But your baby has passed. It was only about 10 weeks of stage. Well, 10 weeks of, you know, growth. And she was, she was so kind. She was like, I'll give you guys a few moments and then I'll come back with some information. I looked at my husband. We're both in tears. All I remember is saying sorry. That's the first thing that came to my head was that stupid x-ray. Thinking that I did it. So the doctor came back in. Gave us information in regards to scheduling a DNC. Because how far along I was. like. Physically, I had to be put under, and uh, that night, the doctor called like at 6 p.m. I was like, why is the doctor calling at 6? And she told me, she's like, hey, I know that this is still raw, and I'm sorry, but your miscarriage is known as a partial molar pregnancy. And that's going to mean that there's going to be other stuff that's going to happen after your DNC. And I was like, I had a partial molar pregnancy. That's what caused the miscarriage. And she's like, yes. And I'm like, okay. And so we scheduled the DNC. That night I looked up what a partial molar pregnancy was. And it wasn't my fault. If anyone knows what a partial molar pregnancy was, it is, it's basically when an egg and a sperm come together, the egg doesn't fuse with the sperm fast enough, then an extra sperm comes in. So the embryo has more chromosomes than what is required. Normally, the embryo would, would pass away very quickly within the first four to five weeks of pregnancy and won't develop or anything, but mine did. Mine developed till 10 weeks and then passed. Now, at roughly around eight weeks, well, was it five, six weeks? Five, six weeks is when a mass starts to grow also inside the uterus. 
this mass of cells continues to grow as if it was the baby growing. This causes your HCG levels to spike extremely like high, like way above the normal. And which caused my extreme nausea. And during this time, as the baby's developing, it can develop somewhat functionally, but it's extremely rare, like very, very, very rare. Even having this pregnancy is extremely rare in the first place. But, and so, the baby grew to 10 weeks and then passed away because of the genetic problems that it had in regards to having those extra chromosomes, extra half set of chromosomes. And the mass kept growing. And so when I was 18 weeks pregnant, I looked 18 weeks pregnant because this stupid mass grew as if it was a baby that was 18 weeks. So I had the DNC. I was put under. I I hate DNCs. I really do. What they do is basically chop up everything inside and suck it out. And uh, apparently there was a lot of mass inside which then caused a lot of scarring on my uterus. Which then added more problems to my fertility issues. Now, because of this partial model of pregnancy, you, uh, you have to be on basically contraception methods because they don't want you pregnant straight away because they want to make sure that they took out all the mess. So you don't have to worry about it coming back like a tumor and then getting chemotherapy. So with the DNC afterwards, you have to be like on the doctor's watch list. You have to do blood work every week for at least four months. And then afterwards, depending on how low it has gotten, and by low, I'm talking about the HCG hormone. That's really the indicator that, that the mass is gone and that your body's recovering. And that's not going to come back. So it was about four months every week. I had to get a blood test to see if this level has gone down. And then it was down enough that I was able to do it every month for five months. So that by this stage, I'm nine months postpartum. Technically. But what sucked was my body. My body grieved because of how far along I was. My boobs started producing milk. So, like the day after the DNC, my boobs were rock hard and it hurt. It hurt so much. I was in so much pain, not just emotionally, but like physically, like <laughs> my poor husband, he had to be really strong for me. And uh, all I wanted to do was hold a child.
After a couple of weeks, I see that feeling went away. My boobs got better. And, uh, and I was starting to feel good. I started to feel like my old self, full of energy, full of life. I'm like an energizer bunny, guys. Like, so being bedridden was, was not me. I started looking for a job because I was a permanent resident so I could work and I needed something. I needed to keep my mind occupied because it was, it was going away. I was losing it. Found a job, which was great. And I started working and every week I took those blood tests. It was kind of like a slap in the face. Like you can't get pregnant until you're cleared. You lost a kid. Like, I know, I know this might sound a little dramatic in regards to losing a child at 10 weeks and other people be like, it was just 10 weeks. Like, that's nothing. Wait till they're 16 or 20 weeks or 21 weeks and then you'll lose the kid or... <sighs> Remember guys, I thought I was 18 weeks pregnant. I thought I was already halfway through. So I started planning things. I started getting stuff. We bought a condo for the head next to room for that child. So every time I looked at it with all the baby stuff, it was, it was hard. Again, because of all these blood tests, I wasn't allowed. To get pregnant until I got cleared or even start trying again because they want to make sure that the mass didn't grow back because if it did I would have been on chemotherapy for a while I just prayed I prayed so hard and Heavenly Father blessed me and my family I got cleared nine months after and we started trying again. We tried for four years. Those four years were rough. So Betty, I am so blessed to be your mum. Even when you keep me up extremely late at night, or you wake up and you just want to play. I am so blessed. Your father and I are so happy that you're here. So, about three months after us trying, so it's been about a year, of finding out that the baby was gone. I had gained a lot of weight because I was so depressed. My husband helped me find a therapist, which helped so much because I was able to, to figure out what was wrong. Maybe not what was wrong, what was I thinking and how to fix my thinking. Maybe not fix it, but help me think through things better. Because I have very high expectations, guys. Like, I... What people would normally think of themselves, I have to think up way higher. It's just... It's just my human nature. How I was brought up. How I... How I see myself. Which is not always a good thing. Especially when you don't make those expectations of yourself. Then you start feeling down. I was very lucky that I didn't have to take any medication. That I was able just to do these exercises. And I am so grateful for therapists that help. That, that helped me 
So thank you. If you're struggling with miscarriages or even just feeling down, please see someone. And it was really good seeing a therapist. I totally recommend it. There's nothing wrong with you. It doesn't matter if the miscarriage happened at four weeks or if it happens at 22 weeks. Nothing is wrong with you. And nothing is wrong with you if you are sad. If you are grieving, if you're mourning for months, years, nothing is wrong. You just need a little help. And that's kind of how I deal with it still. Yes, it's still raw. Do I blame myself anymore? No. It wasn't my fault. I tried everything that I could. This is probably why I'm so paranoid about my daughter now. So, sorry, sweetie. Um, but how I deal with it nowadays is I look back and it makes me feel more human. It makes me help relate to others better either suffering through depression or going through a miscarriage, I feel their pain and help. I feel like I can talk about it more. That I can try to make it more accepting that women can talk about it. That they can share their feelings. Because not only are you grieving in your mind or in your heart, but your body grieves. It's the weirdest thing. But it does, which kind of makes it worse. And it doesn't matter if it was your first pregnancy or your third or your fourth. It's still rough. It's still hard. So dealing with it. Because I never, because of how small my baby was, I didn't get to bury anything. I never got to have like a ceremony or anything like that either. Which was hard. And I realized that just last year when I was pregnant with, with my little one. Well, I didn't really get that closure. I don't really have anything to remind me. Like, yeah, I have a scrapbook of all the different things and, and the CD of my little bubs. But that was it. That was, that was all I had. And... I knew I needed something else, not a headstone. I needed something different. And so, what I did, <laughs> I, I was watching a movie, I think. Actually, I can't right remember. Again, memory loss from pregnancy, guys. Real thing. I, uh, I decided I would love to name a star after that little baby, after the nickname that we gave it. So I found a, you know, stargazing site and got a certificate. I framed that certificate and I hung it up in our, in our living room. And I've got like how to find it. So I already, I have a telescope, science teacher. Okay. And so when my daughter grows up, I'm going to show her that star and I'm going to share with her and any other kids that we have
that family is everywhere. No matter if they've passed or if they haven't. I'm so grateful that I've done that. So if you need something a little different, look into weird options, <laughs> like a, buying a star and naming it, or something else, planting a tree. I didn't want to plant a tree, because I have, I'm not very good at gardening. I'm trying, I'm doing better now that I'm automating water, water systems, but I didn't want to plant something that could die. Because then it kind of be a punch in the stomach again. So, which is kind of ironic because stars are dying suns. Which is kind of interesting. But that's what I went for. And that's how I deal with it. So, um, I'm going to just keep, I'm going to make another video in regards to my fertility journey and how I dealt with it and how I got my little one but I hope I hope that this video has helped you in some form either relieved a little bit of your pain or given you an idea of how to grieve or the help that you might need again a therapist is can work wonders if you get the right one that is. Okay, so don't don't settle for one that you don't like. Try other ones. And uh, I hope this story reaches others that may have just, you know, different kind of miscarriages. But for myself, definitely, a, you know, suffering through a partial molar pregnancy. And, uh, yeah. I hope hope that you guys all have a wonderful day. I'm going to wash my face and kind of freshen up a little bit before I continue to look after my daughter who's napping right now. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and that you guys can work through whatever is going on in your life. Remember to take small and simple steps. What may seem like nothing to someone else may be a huge step to you but just break it down and work through small and simple steps that's the best thing to do when you're trying to push forward through the pain and grief push forward to to be better But I hope that you guys can all be kind and courteous to others as you go through your journey and through your life. And I'll see you in the next video. Alright, bye.